Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains abysmal. And today we are going to discuss that exact thing. Yes, it's time once again to the longest running series on this channel, five more of the worst trains ever, part 17, that's rock. <laughs> the Montreal Locomotive Works RSC-24, constructed between March and April of 1959, only four of these stubby little diesel electrics were produced for the Canadian National Railway. They used the 12-cylinder 244 diesel engine. The engines were actually derated to only 1,400 horsepower. This was to make the locomotives suitable for weight-restricted light rail duties. They also used three-axle trucks to try to spread their weight out, again, to make them more suitable for light rail duties. This meant they had less traction, and that was part of the reason why the engines were derated. They were actually very unique locomotives. They were designed to replace 260 and 460 steam locomotives in eastern Canada. But they never really worked very well. And it was down to their engines, the Model 244. They just never worked reliably. There were always issues with them, and they were never resolved at any point. The engines trucked along till the mid-70s, but by that point Canadian National had had just about enough of them and decided to scrap all four engines. The CAF Urbos 3. I actually had someone call me out on talking about things like streetcars and trams because they're not like full-size trains, but they're still trains. Like, they're still running on rails. I think they're totally fair game for this series. So, you know, fight me, I guess. And as you can see, the Urbos 3, in fact, the entire Urbos line, is a modern-style trolley or tram or streetcar, whatever you want to call it, designed to operate very short regional services. What the CAF stands for? Well, that's the manufacturer, which is... Oh dear. Okay, I only promised to try. Constructionis e auxiliar de ferrocarrelis. I don't know how close I was. I, I gave it a shot. I am so sorry if I butchered that. We're just going to call them CAF this whole time. Or CAF. Now, the Urbos line overall has seen a lot of success. They were decent trams. That was until the Urbos 3. The 3 is currently undergoing some major, major, major problems that it seems that every railway that's incorporated them is experiencing. On the surface, they actually had a lot of potential. CAF has the option to allow them to operate off of a lithium-ion battery, so they can actually operate on non-electrified lines for a limited amount of time, which is kind of cool. Depending on the, each unit's total length, they can seat up to 327 people and travel upwards of 50 miles an hour, or 80 kilometers an hour in certain places. But like I said, they're flawed. The first ones to discover it was the Bessacon Tranway in Bessacon, France. The Urbo 3s had cracks around the bogey box area of their bodies. This was in 2017, and CAF would eventually pay for the remedial work to be done but over time, other railways, like West Midlands Metro and the Sydney L1 Dulwich Hill Line in New South Wales, also discovered the same exact problem. The units were cracking. Repeatedly. Over and over and over again. This is a rather recent development, with some of the problems actually being discovered just last year. So it's hard to say what the future holds for the Urbos 3, but as of right now, it's not looking too good. Many of the lines had to be closed down entirely because they were reliant on these Urbos units, and they can't be used because it's too dangerous. The cracking could easily get worse and cause an accident. We can't risk that, obviously. The Milwaukee Road Class EP3. Not to be confused with the EP2, they look nothing alike. While the EP2s were great and built by General Electric, the EP-3s were built by Baldwin and Westinghouse. They were actually nicknamed quills because they used a quill drive. It's a mechanism that allows a drive shaft to shift its position relative to its driving shaft. 
Sounds weird, but it seemed success. In fact, the system was used incredibly effectively on the GG1. From that, it could be suggested that the EP3s must have been really good, right? Built in 1919, 10 of them were put together, they were big, powerful, with a maximum speed of 65 miles per hour or 105 kilometers an hour. Well, they're on this list, so you know how this is going to go. They didn't work out so good. Even though they were virtually identical to New Haven's successful EP2s, yes, they were also called EP2s, this is getting very confusing, I agree. Not Milwaukee Road's EP2s, New Haven's EP2s, totally different, and the EP2s from New Haven are somewhat identical to the EP3s from Milwaukee Road. Ooh! However, there were some differences. Milwaukee Road's EP3s were heavier, while also having a more lightly built frame. This was a really bad design choice, as they started experiencing broken axles and frame members. Their wheels and spokes started cracking, and they had deformed suspension springs. Upon investigation, Westinghouse was very embarrassed, as they had simply designed locomotive bodies not to be strong enough to withstand how heavy they were. There was also very little lateral play in the drivers themselves, and this caused the wheels to wear out very quickly, and the frames kept breaking due to the stress of high-speed operation. They did attempt to make some changes. Baldwin actually recommended they split them in two to make them permanently couple two unit box cabs, and they tried that experiment with one of them, and it didn't help. Milwaukee Road conducted their own design changes, using heavier steel for the frames, as well as new trucks that could help guide the locomotives on curves, so they worked a lot better after those fixes, but even then they never really met the standards. Milwaukee Road's mechanical department had to rebuild them five times during their service lives, which is way too many times, and they were also prone to derailing, which great, that was good too. After World War II, when Milwaukee Road looked at refurbishing all their electric locomotives for continued service, the quills weren't included in that program. Out of the ten of them, three had actually already been retired due to wrecks, and the other seven were all scrapped by 1957. The Victorian Railway's W Class. This group of 27 tiny, tiny, adorable diesel hydraulic locomotives were shunters that were built by Tulock Limited for Victorian Railways in Australia. And as much as I think they're cute, and as nice as they look, I gotta be honest with you, these things are complete pieces of junk! And I hate that! I hate having to say it, because I really like how they look. They kind of remind me of the teddy bear. But unlike the teddy bear, these things were terrible. As shunters, they were slow, which is normal. They got a maximum speed of 32 kilometers an hour, or only 20 miles per hour. But for their job, that's totally fine. What wasn't fine was their engines. Their V12 diesel engines were absolute, absolute garbage. Completely useless. Crews hated these little things so much. They had poor ride quality already, but generally it's possible to get over that if they worked. They didn't. Their engines failed constantly, and sometimes the Victorian Railways wanted them to work on the main line. But in order to do that, they needed a transmission change because, by default, they were simply too slow. Their high gear setting was removed early on, but even as shunters, they really weren't that good. Their cab profile made visibility difficult, and the crews had to lean out of the side, as if they were working a steam locomotive, in order to observe shunting instructions, which kind of defeated the purpose of utilizing a modern diesel, don't you think? Oh, their transmission seized. That happened too. And they also suffered oil leaks onto their steps, which created a slip hazard. And their engine blocks failed. That too. That happened too. A lot went wrong on these, is what I'm trying to say. They first ran in 1959, and by the mid-70s, Victorian Railways thought, maybe now's about a good time to try to address this thing's problems. At least ten of the engines had their Mercedes V12s removed and replaced with General Motors diesel units. This made them work a bit better, but they still really weren't that much fun for the crews to work on due to the ride quality and overall conditions of the cab. Perhaps due to their nature as teeny tiny diesels, five of them actually wound up in preservation. Since, you know, small diesels are really good for heritage railways, and I totally get that. The remaining 22 were all scrapped. Because, no. The Aero Wagon, or Aeromoto Wagon. <laughs> really? We're gonna do this again, are we? I thought we already talked about this. 
the Sheenan Zeppelin already kind of revealed the problem with this uh, relative idea. Though, to be fair, this actually predates the Sheenan Zeppelin. This one was constructed in Russia in 1917. Only one was put together, and it was invented by a man named Valerian Abakovsky. He was a Soviet engineer from Latvia, and much like they were trying to do with the Sheenan Zeppelin, Abakovsky wanted to combine the elements of an aircraft with a train. The result was the railcar Aerowagon, which despite looking kinda rickety if I'm being honest, and alarming in that regard, the Aerowagon was actually really fast, especially in those days. It could reach 140 kilometers per hour, or 87 miles per hour, which was impressive for 1917. The propeller worked in terms of providing a very fast method of drive. It's just... It's a propeller. On the ground. Next to people. They're right there. There's nothing about this that's safe, is what I'm trying to say. That's what I've always said when it comes to these propeller-driven railcars. It's simply not a reasonable thing to do. Information is also a bit hard to come by regarding other issues it may have had, Though I imagine it would have suffered similar problems to the Sheenan Zeppelin, such as not being able to go backward, or struggling up hills. But its major fault seemed to be a lack of stability, because it crashed. Horribly so. It was meant to carry Soviet officials as a much faster method of traveling on the rails, which it could do that, sure. But on the 24th of July, 1921, a group of delegates of the first contrast of the Profiturn which was led by Fyodor Sergeyev, decided to take the aero wagon from Moscow to Tula in order to test it. Abakovsky himself was also on board at the time. Now, the aero wagon did get to Tula, and very quickly, but on its way back, it derailed going at very high speed, and this killed six of the 22 people on board, and a seventh died later of his injuries. Among the dead was Valerian Abakovsky himself. He was only 25 years old. The aero wagon was never rebuilt after that, although like I said, the Sheenan Zeppelin was also a thing that was attempted. But the point is, it failed. Please stop putting propellers on locomotives. It really just doesn't seem to work that well, is what I'm trying to say. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual of Bond, farewell.